around. And at the same time, um, he started noticing small little groups of transients, uh, these transient groups, he called them. Um, and now, uh, thanks to his knowledge and, his, and the work that he had done with his colleagues, they've now renamed, uh, dedicated the, the name of transient actually to Biggs killer whales uh, in honor of his research. Uh, so the first orcas that were actually captured um, were transient. Uh, in 1970, were one of the first earliest groups of transients to be recognized. Um, in March 1970, a group of five killer whales were captured in Pedder Bay, uh, which is just off southern Vancouver Island. It's about a 17 to 20 minute drive outside of Victoria towards Souk. And um, the first animals were actually known as M-Pod or the T2s. And this is an old photograph of sea at Sealand of the Pacific, which is in Oak Bay. Um, you can see here a, a famous individual named Chimo, uh, T4, which was uh, the first, one of the first albino killer whales to be seen off of British Columbia. And at the time, the T2s, they numbered five whales uh, and they were captured here. And they were one of the, they had one of the longest lasting fastings of any, um, any killer whale captured. They had actually fasted 77 days uh, before they started eating. But at the time, um, capturing a white killer whale was unheard of. And there was only three killer whale, white killer whales seen in British Columbia since the 1920s. Uh, 1924 being one of the periods where a transient orca was sighted in Northern British Columbia. And then uh, another white orca in the 1940s named Alice T6, which was believed to be part of the same group, disappeared and then Chimo was sighted in the 1970s. Um, unfortunately, at the time when this orca was captured, uh, they didn't understand a little uh, as much about the genetics of killer whales and some of the diseases that some of these orcas have. And um, it actually ended up that Chimo had a rare genetic disorder um, that ended up ending her life um, very early on in the first 10 years. Uh, you can see here, she's beside her presumed mother T3. Um, and this, as I mentioned, was one of the first groups of transients ever, ever, uh, ever labeled as transient. Uh, this is T4, Chimo being taken out of the water um, and supported. Uh, they put her on a flatbed truck and then she'll be maneuvered off to Oak Bay at the time. So at the period when Chimo was being captured, um, there was a bit of a public outcry um, and the people were getting upset because there was, as killer whales were being captured, more and more people's understanding of that these were intelligent animals, um, that they were, um, friendly toward their captors, especially to, at the time, to their, to um, whale, whale trainers. Um, and at the point that people just did not want to see that happen anymore. So of the Petter Bay five, the five whales, Chimo was uh, taken to sea land, as well as another animal named Nuka, who was a T5 that was taken to um, sea land of the Pacific. T3, the presumed mother of Chimo died during a capture. Uh, she was, she had fasted for 77 days and then suffered from malnutrition and drowned in the net. And T1 and T2 were the, the final two orcas. And they were uh, released by someone in the middle of the night. And years later, uh, they recited, this is a T1, um, also named Charlie Chin, uh, beside another transient orca off near, towards near Vancouver recited. Uh, this master line soon numbered three animals over the years, so T1, and then uh, our T2 and presumed son T1, and then she had another son, uh, T, T, T2A. Uh, and then um, at the test time gone one, on though, T, uh, Charlie Chin had des actually disappeared, T1 and passed away, and then she had another offspring. So today actually um, it survived, this group is survived by her, um, off, her daughters. Uh, so T2B, here's a matrilineal um, genealogical a schematic of the family group known as the T2s. Um, as of 2020, though, T2C2, the bottom animal that was born in 2005, had passed away, has passed away. Um, but T the T2s are still still around and, uh, and doing quite well. Um, here's a little bit of a small video to show you. Uh, this group was very interesting. As I mentioned, the, the genetics were a little bit odd um, as having an albino individual that didn't make it past the age of um, 11 to 15 years of age is what they, they, uh, they guessed Chimo's age was. Uh, but also other animals in this group have also had deformities on their, under, on their jaws, 
um, around their face. Um, and then T2C2 here, which I'll explain a little bit of the terminology here um, with the naming, but he suffered from scoliosis. And here's a little footage of uh, what he, what his, um, let me see if this works, there you go. I dark water, but you can see scoliosis. Um, so each animal in this matril line seemed to have some sort of genetic deformity. So when we talk about transients, the, the research really expanded after that as we started to understand that there was more than just one form or ecotype of killer whale. Uh, so the distribution of transient killer whale populations in the Northeastern Pacific is actually an area I'm very interested in. And it um, initially was believed to be uh, one major population. There wasn't a lot of sightings of transients in the 1970s or 1980s. Um, off, off BC, there was, um, they were transient, they'd frequent the outer coast, they'd, yeah, they'd periodically show up in off southern Vancouver Island. Um, and you can see here, um, there, now we know uh, there is multiple communities actually that are um, spatially distinct or overlap unevenly um, between the different communities. And uh, so the first ones are the West Coast transients, which we know of as the killer whales, the transients we see in British Columbia, uh, in off Southeastern Alaska and down the Southern California coast. We have uh, the Gulf of Alaska transients, which are distributed throughout the Gulf of Alaska into the Bering Sea, the Aleutian Islands. Um, the AT1s, which are actually a very unique community. Um, that were discovered in 1984 and numbered 22 animals. And prior, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill uh, declined to around 12 animals. And now there's only seven animals with no reproductive females. So that population will go extinct, but they do not intermingle with um, the St. Patrick Gulf of Alaska transients. Um, so they're a unique community. Um, and most of this, they spend most of their time in the Prince William Sound and Akinia Fjords. Um, and then further south off of um, southern Vancouver Island down to California, um, we're starting to find a trend with um, cal these California or outer coastal transients, we're calling them, uh, that spend, that also interact with the west coast transients. Uh, um, but all, all the transient ecotype do not associate with other killer whales like the residents or offshores. Uh, so movement patterns, transients are very much sporadic. They often don't stay in one area long and we do see large movements. I had actually encountered the T124s in 2012 in Southeast Alaska and uh, near Dawes Glacier in Endicott Arm. And about two weeks later, I had encountered them off Southern Vancouver Island. Um, so quite a distance uh, for their movements. They, uh, killer whales in general can move over hundred kilometers a day. Uh, so they're constantly on the lookout for food. Uh, the transient population in particular go into small areas, into coves, into bays, into inlets, looking for their main prey, which are pinnipeds like harbor seals and sea lions. So um, they spend a lot of time in, they can be anywhere along the coast uh, where the resident orcas spend a lot more time in the open straits, um, usually going between headland and headland looking for, looking for salmon. Uh, so a little bit of social organization. I talked a little bit about um, the T2s and T2A and T or T2C and T2B. And how does that, how do we really come up with this naming system? Well, uh, it was Michael Big that kind of came, he came up with that naming system where an individual was giving an alphanumeric designation. So with transient, the, the first letter that alphanumeric is T for transient. And then the first letter of the match line or the first whale that they encountered like T2. Uh, and then if she had an offspring, we T2, T2A, T2B, T2C, the third offspring, and so forth. Um, and if T2C had a calf, it would end up being T2C1, T2C2, T2C3, and, uh, and so forth. If T2C had a calf, it would be T2C1A, and then it and then continues from there. So for instance, here's a natural line we, we studied in, in California, the Monterey Coast. Um, that's uh, a mother, you can see her right here, this uh, OCT30, her son and daughter, OCT30B and C, her brother, OTC60, uh, and then you can see her grandkids, um, OCT30B1, B2. So killer whales live in a matrilineal society. 
Uh, so it's based on a female and her succeeding offspring. Um, and similar to elephants, uh, except for in this case, and in, especially in resident orcas, uh, there's very little dispersal between uh, members in the pod. A transient society, though, is much more fluid. Uh, we see individuals disappear from the region for years at a time, and sometimes from their natal natural line, uh, partic particularly males. So examples, example here is OTC-60. Um, he is a, 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 this individual OTC-30's brother, but he'll disappear from time to time and join other natural lines and spend significant amount of time not with her and her parent natural line. But then they often will meet up again uh, to socialize. So just a little bit of the trends um, I would like to share with you. Uh, we compiled our data for the last, from basically 2006 to 2018, um, sharing some of this information with local communities on some of the trends we're seeing in the big killer whales, so the transients. Uh, in particular, um, uh, we collected uh, 3,835 sightings, as well as a mix of that with encounters we had off Southern Vancouver Island, which was close to about 50 encounters. Uh, with transient orcas. Uh, this is uh, a, our, our distribution of sightings along the entire uh, north, uh, west coast of North America, or west coast of um, Bank, uh, British Columbia and the United States. And you can see here uh, the red dots are um, these coastal transients. So basically like the T2s would have belonged to this, this population. I'll get into a little bit more about these the West Coast community, but uh, for now, we're, we're starting to uh, get a bit of an understanding that there may be more than one community of transient orca on the coast, uh, belonging to the West Coast subpopulation. So in this case, we have a coastal community and potentially an outer coastal community of killer whale. Um, the green dot is basically unknowns, but potentially a presumed transients um, based on group size and if they've been attacking marine mammals, but we couldn't get an ID on them. Um, and then we also occasionally get uh, sightings of Alaska transients that visit the Salish Sea. Uh, but this is just a bit of our distribution here of our sighting network. Uh, so first, the coastal transients, um, which are the by far the most studied pop, uh, community of transient orca or subpopulation of, of transients on the coast, are the most interesting. And uh, we right now seeing a huge increase. So right now there's close to 350 animals since 2012, where initially the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada has been following the dynamics of the population uh, through their census work that they continue that they've continued since the 1970s. And in 2012, there was around 304 animals. Uh, this coastal community are distributed distributed from Southeast Alaska to Southern California. Um, but very different. Um, we're not seeing it as being, uh, we're seeing it more as um, a longitudinally. We're not seeing them far offshore. This coastal community prefers to be close to the shoreline um, in um, response to most likely their prey resources like pinnipeds, harbor seals, sea lions. Um, and they spend most of their time going in and out of bays into inlets um, in search of prey. Uh, so a little bit of a zoom in here of this, this map. We had 2,799 sightings since 2009 to 2018 uh, of coastal transients. Um, and this was very interesting for us because we're seeing a bit of a pattern here, especially in regions like off southern Vancouver Island and then um, central to northeastern Vancouver Island. Uh, this population increase likely could be due to their main prey, uh, which is uh, the Pacific Harbor Seal, which I'll talk about a little bit further down here. Um, group size, uh, in comparison, like I mentioned earlier, that transients live in smaller groups. Uh, on average now, it's about four to five animals that we're seeing, which is about a, it's a bit of an increase from uh, three, uh, an average of three animals that were, were encountered in the 1990s. A study that uh, Robin Baird and Larry Dill had uh, connect, c conducted early on. Uh, but we're starting to see a bit of an increase, but still that same group size of four to five animals, where if you see resident orcas, it's a lot larger, 20 to 25, up to 50 animals, depending on the pod you're, you're looking at. Association patterns, um, this is a bit of a confusing uh, sociogram, but we see tight clusters with certain groups off of Southern Vancouver Island, uh, specifically um, certain groups that we see most of the time, and then other groups that we see um, spend less time together. Um, some of these groups might be more related to others, but um, so far we don't know. It was uh, 
some of these animals that are still alive may have been associating uh, long before the studies started in the 1970s. Um, so just a little bit about uh, their foraging ecology, foraging and diet dietary ecology. These guys are, the transients are mammal hunting specialists. They are the top of the food chain in our area here and uh, they focus on marine mammals. So you can see here a photograph of a harbor, harbor porpoise uh, being thrown through the air uh, by a group of coastal transients. Um, as I mentioned, they're what we call quaternary consumers. So they're at the top of the food chain. Uh, so basically, how do we study this kind of their, their diet and their foraging? Uh, a couple methods uh, is observation is uh, the, the most often what we see is observation. We also can use stomach contents through stranded animals, which is not very common. Um, we also um, can use biopsy work using fatty acid analysis, or um, we can use um, stable isotopes. Um, one of the most, one of the more interesting ways to do it now that's less invasive is uh, some of the work we are doing here um, during a killer health health assessment off of uh, San Juan Island is fecal analysis or fecal sampling, where you actually collect a, a sample. Um, and often with transients, it's very difficult. I think we got our first sample in 80 hours. <laughs> it actually took to get a sample, but it's usually a clump of fur. Um, and that, can, you know, a lot of genetics comes with that too as well. You can tell if it's what kind of prey, if it's a harbor seal or if it's a Pacific white-sided dolphin. And often it just takes a lot of time just following behind the whales. For most of our work though, it's direct observation of predations. Um, uh, for us, we see, especially at the coastal community, it's mostly harbor seal, sea lion, uh, unknown sea lion, or stellar California sea lion, or northern elephant seal. So a report that comes in, we don't often have someone that can, uh, the individual doesn't often, isn't often able to discern between stellar sea lions or California sea lion. Uh, so we have a, a, an area there for just sea lion. Um, we have 107 predation events that we've, that we've collected. Um, Northern elephant seal is by far uh, less common of the species that we've seen, but there's been uh, a case or two of those. Um, prey on cetacean species. Um, harbor porpoise is by far the most dominant species. Um, we have 55 cases. Uh, uh, what's really interesting though is we have had um, documentation of gray whales being attacked, um, which is much less common than the smaller cetaceans, especially the coastal community of transients. Um, we've seen humpback whales being attacked as well as um, minke whales. Uh, so just a little bit of some of the data that we collected. Um, you can see here harbor seal by, this is through direct encounters that uh, basically 213 different observations uh, with harbor seal being by far the most, up there at around 37, 38%. Um, uh, we also have an unknown column though that's prey that we don't really know when we come on scene and we see uh, without genetics we we really don't know the animal or the or fatty acid analysis we don't know the prey and this is often if they're in the middle of a hunt or, or middle of feeding. Um, sea lion, harbor porpoise, uh, pacific white-sided dolphins and down to northern elephant seal uh, as the different prey items that we see here. Uh, so Pacific Harbor Seal is by far the most common uh, prey species and likely um, one of the major um, ecological drivers be, uh, for in it that has caused the evolution of transient killer whales on our coast. Um, harbor seals make up, as I said, 30 up to 37 to 38% on the study that we conducted. They initially though were on our coast were very common. It was uh, in the night in the 1880s, it was thought that they had numbered close to 100,000 100, individuals. Um, they were called between 1962 and 1968. Now, it's really interesting and we'll never know is how that impact of that call or that harvest um, due to uh, pressure from fisheries um, with the government, how that really affected the population of killer whales on our coast as, as, um, as studies and observations in the 1970s suggest that transients really were not that abundant or frequently cited as much. Um, and uh, at this point right now where the population of harbor seals is leveled out and it's close to about 100,000 once again. Uh, so, but the transient population has also increased, um, as I mentioned before, to 350 animals and we're seeing them um, much more. 
Um, another interesting fact is that the harbor seal pupping seasons along the Pacific coast um, have a client. So they, a client is basically that the pupping occurs at different periods of time. Um, earlier in the waters off of for between southeast Alaska and further north, and it gets a little later into uh, so around June to July, in off of Vancouver Island in Puget Sound, and then it gets earlier again as you head down the coast off of California, March, April. Um, for us, what's a question that we're really interested in is is does this climb affect the movements of transients? But some of these areas are very difficult to try to access, especially off the outer coast of Washington, where there is. Um, uh, where the time where the the pupping season occurs occurs earlier, we are it start it's very difficult to try to find that information and, and uh, the sightings are much less frequent. Um, so often when hunting seals, what we see a lot of is this near shore foraging we call it or haul out foraging, where transients will spend a frequent amount of time close to close to a haul out site site. Um, often trying to scare pinnipeds into the water, going into small areas here. You can see this female T60. She was trying to scare a pup into the water. This was just off Souk, BC. Um, we often have calves too as well, getting quite close to these, these haul out sites uh, to, try to, to try to scare a seal into the water. Uh, this was a very interesting observation we saw where these two females here uh, played decoy with um, a group of harbor seals. We had actually positioned our, our vessel behind a group of seals as we watched these transients come out front to hopefully see if they would they would come around to try to hunt. Unfortunately, the females didn't, but what we didn't realize was there was a male transient just uh, in, underneath the water there, and he actually grabbed a seal um, very close to the water's edge. And uh, unfortunately, we did not see it, so we actually weren't able to get a photograph because it kind of startled us as we were, we didn't, he, we didn't know he was there. Um, you can see here, this harbor seal is very lucky. He's far out of the water. Um, you can see him in the background there. But as mentioned, this, this was in the Oak Bay chain group. He, uh, these transients get really close into these rocky areas, into these kelp beds. Um, often they'll, uh, with transients, they're not, they don't use a lot of communication when hunting. So they keep their vocalizations to a minimum and they specifically listen, we, what we call passive listening for prey splashing. Um, marine mammals have very acute hearing, which means they could pick up the vocalizations of killer whales. And um, it's, it's, it actually has been shown that they can discern um, the differences in the sounds between the different communities of killer whale being resident or transient. Um, and in, especially with groups that are more well known to be in the area. So they've been able to recognize uh, like Southern resident orcas, which don't pose a threat, uh, but uh, not with uh, what not with transients. Transients use this passive listening. They listen for the splashing, um, and then uh, they will they'll get a seal that way or a sea lion. This seal here was um, actually trying to play, trying to be a transient at one point. I think uh, so they were both spy hopping here, and hopefully he was hoping that uh, the transients wouldn't recognize him as a seal. But that didn't work out too well for him. And uh, he, uh, so this is some of that similar behavior. There's a lot of co uh, t uh, playing with them. They'll, not often a seal is killed right away. Um, they'll they'll toy or play or carry a seal around or. Uh, basically play with it for numerous, numerous hours at a time. Uh, sometimes though, kills are very quick, um, especially with harbor seals can last a minute to five minutes. Uh, and it depends on the type of prey as well. Uh, then other occasions, uh, if we show up on site with a group of transients and we, we don't know what they've killed, often we know a predation has been has happened if there's lots of marine birds in the area, lots of seagulls that are diving down for bits of tissue. Uh, we also see uh, oil slicks on the surface here. You can see a bit of an oil and blood slick on the surface. Uh, this group that are actually splitting a, a, a harbor porpoise. Um, we also see a, um, predation on sea lions. You can see some stellar sea lions uh, basking out here. Um, and this sometimes transients won't always go in close to shore. They'll catch these pinnipeds out in open water. And in this case, the, they'll use that use the open water to their advantage to try to uh, set, to make it less difficult for the seal to try to swim back to shore. Um, last week, we actually witnessed a hunt that lasted over four hours. Um, and they had, they had kept trying to keep the, the stellar sea lion from getting onto a local um, haul out site near Souk. And they continually tried to separate it, tried to push it away from the shoreline. So open water can often be um, used to their advantage. 
Um, once they get a sea lion in open water or if they're working on hunting it, they use a lot of ramming. So basically they'll ram the sea lion continually. Um, and the difference in size between a killer whale and a sea lion is uh, pretty phenomenal with orcas being, uh, with a female orca being eight to 9,000 pounds and males up to 15,000 um, and sea lions being, uh, a stellar sea lion being up to 2,000 or 2,500. The big difference is, is that uh, why a killer whale just doesn't go in and grab onto it is the fact that a lot of these sea lions are pretty difficult. They have large teeth, uh, large canines, and being bitten by a killer, be, being bitten by a sea lion, is probably not a good, not a great, um, not a great way to be injured, especially in nature if you don't want to get an infection. So often they'll bram them, use their flukes to slap them. Um, they'll breach out of the water on top of them, and they'll continually do this um, for hours on end until that sea lion wears out. Um, a lot of sea lion predations don't aren't successful though. We see the sea lion get away, or um, that water that killer whales chase the sea lion in too shallow of water, or the sea lion where it becomes too dangerous for the killer whales to hunt. Uh, in this case here, you can see this adult male stellar sea lion. Uh, we watched he was being rammed uh, continuously. You can see the wounds on the side of him. He had a, a few deep puncture wounds. It's unknown how resilient the sea lions are afterwards to these predations, but uh, they're um, definitely some of them do get away. Um, some of the more exciting uh, foraging offenses on small cetaceans. Um, we see they're by far the most exciting and interesting to watch. Uh, this is a transient that's throwing a Pacific white-sided dolphin through the air off California. Uh, they're not as, they're definitely not uh, they're definitely difficult to hunt, um, but they're also not as dangerous as a sea lion. Uh, we have three predominantly sighted small cetaceans, the harbor porpoise, specific white-sided dolphins, and doll's porpoise. Um, and each one, uh, they use behaviors uh, to hunt that are a little differently. Um, same, similar to sea lions, they do a lot of ramming. Uh, but the difference is, is doll's porpoise and harbor porpoise are very quick and agile and smart, and as well as specific white-sided dolphins. Um, uh, this specific white-sided dolphin, you can see the rake marks on the side. Uh, is likely likely survived from a, an attack with transients, uh, but once a once a doll's porpoise or a harbor porpoise is found, they will split up in a group. One individual initiates the hunt, um, and they'll they'll chase the the doll's porpoise or the harbor porpoise or the Pacific white-sided dolphin or the small cetacean for numerous numerous minutes. Um, with one individual starting to tire out, another individual will often take over on the hunt, and this could last for. 10 to 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Sometimes the uh, on especially with dolls porpoise, which are uh, very one of the fastest species of cetaceans, uh, they often get away um, more often than not. And uh, but they're very exciting hunts because the uh, killer whales often breach clear out of the water or the porpoise clear out of the water as they pursue them. Uh, this harbor, this doll's porpoise actually was killed and left uh, behind from a group of transients off Tofino we had witnessed. Um, this, this animal was unfortunate. It was a very young animal too as well. Uh, probably within a few weeks, his teeth still hadn't um, erupted through the bottom of the gum. Uh, and this animal ended up at the collections at the Royal BC Museum. Uh, large cetaceans, especially with the inner the coastal community of transients, aren't frequently seen. We had a report here from colleagues in Tofino that actually witnessed a group of transients known as the T-18s attack a gray whale calf. Um, the hunt wasn't successful, but they definitely were trying their hardest to, to get at this gray whale. We do not see large whale predations as frequent as we do with the outer coast population. Um, prey sharing. Often though, with transients in comparison to other killer whale populations like the, like the resident orcas, resident orcas will often split up and forage independently. Um, they'll spread out over a large range and look for prey, uh, look for salmon. With transients though, it's very cooperative. Um, it's usually, like I mentioned, members working together to try to get a seal or, or a porpoise or a sea lion. Um, and once they get it, they often will split it apart and share pieces of it. Uh, here's a harbor seal head. Uh, we had watched uh, this killer whale carry over. Um, so sorry for the gruesome photos, but uh, yeah, they will split it apart. Um, often they'll grab onto a seal or um, another marine mammal, they'll split it apart or what this behavior called, we call moonwalking, where they'll back apart and pull the seal apart. Um, they will do it quickly. Um, often the seal is still alive when they split it apart. Um, and then they'll often also as well, um, a process, especially with sea lions, they'll 
they'll do what's called butchering well they'll beat the animal or throw it through the air repeatedly with their flukes um and that softens the hide where they can split it apart um this was just a shot here so what's one of the most interesting thing about foraging paper is that we discovered um a brand new foraging behavior that we had never seen before um, on in the coastal waters up here, and it's only been just only been seen in South America and in the Crozy Islands is a intentional stranding. And recently, we just published a paper that should be out next month. But here's a photograph of this intentional stranding event um, that happened off a of protection island in Washington State, where a group of known coastal transients had been hunting a group of harbor seals on a sandy cobble beach. Now, if you're familiar with the behavior that's done by uh, the type A Antarctic orcas in Argentina, the killer whales use these steep slope beaches that are soft cobble or sand to get themselves up onto the beach using a wave to grab a seal or a sea lion to bring it back into the water to, to eat. Um, it's a very risky behavior, um, not seen in other populations except for recently, where we witnessed uh, this transient, uh, this group of transients using this behavior where they intentionally stranded, they performed it three times um, and in the process scared a, a seal pup into the water and uh, they were able to grab it. This individual here was actually completely, um, his body was completely um, out of the water on sand. Um, he was kicking up quite a bit of uh, uh, silt into the water and uh, he had to push himself off of the, off of the sand. Um, so group size during predation fence is similar. It's the same, about four to five animals. So the same groups. Uh, occasionally we see groups meet up once a prey has been killed. Um, often transients will start to vocalize quite a bit. So they've remained silent when they're hunting, but once they've got a prey and they killed it, they start vocalizing. Um, and that can be, uh, there could be a, a benefit or it can be a negative for other transients in the area, especially if another transient pod's coming through that's also hunting. By that point, at least if another group has started vocalizing, um, it may decrease the chance of the other transient groups uh, for finding prey. But it also may be, an, an, uh, especially for closely related groups that um, would that have the benefit of socializing with known members or for groups that may want to mate with other groups, um, other transient groups, that's a benefit to um, being able to meet up. And we do once in a while see transient groups that once they've made a kill, they will meet up with another group. Um, so the last five years um, have been really interesting. We've been focusing most of our, most of our work in off of Monterey Bay, California, on the outer coast, um, central coast of California. And we've been focusing on a, a poorly known community called uh, the Outer Coast Transients. Um, and how it kind of started, uh, the interest was that I was, I was in 2009 sitting outside of Race Rocks and we had watched a, a group of transients kill a California sea lion. And all of a sudden we were kind of looking through the binoculars and a fisherman had called uh, previously and said, we've well, got, got a big group of killer whales coming towards you. Uh, so we continued watching this one little group and uh, this big group of killer whales come towards us. And we were really excited because we thought they were resident orcas. Um, and you know, we were transients and we don't see, uh, there's very little interaction between the two types of killer whale. And we saw uh, this big group show up and we counted uh, 46 different whales. Um, we were able to ID, which was one of the largest transient groups we had seen. But at that point, we had actually, and you can see in the left-hand corner, that big male with the almost like a can opener, his actual nickname is can opener, um, is known as OCT1, was one of the individuals. We had no idea at the time who he was. And this started to repeat itself over the years. Uh, in the 2011, 2012, we started to see transient groups associating with some of these coastal transients. And we became, we really wanted to understand a little bit more about who these whales were. And we started to discover that a lot of them are actually from the outer coast, uh, especially off of California. Um, so at that time I ended up, I decided to uh, go down to California and I joined a nonprofit called Marine Life Studies at the time. And I started studying the population down there. Uh, so our main study area was the Monterey and transition Eco region, which uh, spans from about Fort Bragg, California, down to about Point Conception. It's a very uh, productive region full of uh, upwelling events, and, but deep water canyons and a, and a steep continental shelf that comes really close to, close to the shore. Um, and our primary study area is in between Santa Cruz and the Carmel, California, which is Monterey Bay. Um, and this area is uh, very famous for the Monterey Submarine Canyon, which is um, uh, an amazing area if you ever get a chance to go there to watch cetaceans. It's a, it also, if you're a birder, um, it's a spectacular spot. Um, but at the time, 
this was the place to really find these killer whales. And um, we've identified now a, a 170 different animals. Um, it's growing, our list is growing. Um, I've recently been in contact with and working collaboratively with uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center, NOAA. Um, and um, we're starting to learn a little bit more about these animals. Um, one of, the one of the first studies was in 1997. Uh, they cataloged uh, quite a few killer whales off of California, but no catalog was ever updated since then. And many of the animals either, either died or had calves that grew up and weren't been, were not identified or been able to re-identify those individuals. So we came up with a naming system uh, to distinguish basically the outer coast transients from the coastal transients um, because these animals frequently are sighted in open water and not in the coastal waters of the Salish Sea. Um, and we called them outer coastal transient just to distinguish coastal from outer coastal. Um, they're seasonally distributed though, similar to, to the coastal transients that, um, that hunt seals, but, uh, and they also intermix with the, the local West Coast transients. Um, we have sightings though, all along the coast, as I mentioned, um, and we're getting more and more. I recently just got a sighting from NOAA of a group. Um, we recognized uh, that we're 167 kilometers offshore of Monterey Bay, uh, killing a, an unidentified marine mammal species, which was um, um, really interesting that far offshore. Um, there's been sightings though of some of these unknown ident unidentified groups. Uh, one in 1997, where a group had actually attacked a um, a herd of sperm whales, female sperm whales. Um, we were able to get some of those IDs as well. Uh, but most of these animals um, spend most of their time in these offshore waters. So it's very difficult to try to get uh, this information, information on them just because of the remoteness and difficulty of surveying these offshore waters. Uh, so since 2006, we continue to identify these different animals up until 2020. And um, as you can see here, our line is not plateaued yet. Um, we're still identifying new animals. Uh, recently, we identified three new whales. Uh, so the population uh, that have not been matched to any other community of transients. So it's really exciting for us to, to identify new animals. Um, and and we've, been able, we've been able to identify them through association with known transients. So um, we know that they're transient ecotype. Um, so most of our sightings occurred right here in conjunction with the Monterey Canyon. Um, we had 150 sightings of transient killer whales along the Monterey Canyon here. Uh, and seasonally, uh, so the group size we observed too as well was um, uh, very similar to the coastal transients, uh, around five or six, between three and six animals. Um, and then occasionally we have these large groups that are of uh, 25 or more, and it's often more than one family group that come together to forage or socialize. Um, their foraging and dietary ecology, though, of the outer coast transient killers are very different. So the group size, a lot of similarities between them. They share the transient ecotype uh, genetics. They are similar acoustically, too, as well. Uh, there's a few um, differences, though, in their vocalizations, uh, but their diet is, is very different. Um, the transients down in Monterey, um, are also uh, are a lot different. They eat larger prey, um, like gray whale. I can see that photograph here with the gray whale calf being rammed. Uh, but with their prey, they also are seasonally, they show up in around March through May. Um, and then we have another spike between September and December uh, and then a big decrease throughout there. Not all animals are seen um, more groups. Some groups are seen more often than others. Um, and not and some groups are not seen within or, or we see maybe one every five years that we've had a free sighting of them uh, where they go we don't know but what we do know from some of the work that we're doing with NOAA Southwest Fisheries is that uh, some of these groups are sighted quite a far offshore and throughout the, the um, offshore waters between Washington and California uh, so this seasonal uh, occurrence pattern here especially between March and May, is a peak period for gray whale calves. Um, you can see here from the, some of the data on the predations that we collected in California, um, the gray whale calf and, and sea lion, predominantly California sea lion, are the two major prey. Now, gray whale calves are only hunted during those months between, um, between March and May. Uh, and it's kind of interesting um, that we don't see it, uh, we don't see it, um, in the months of November or December as gray whales come back down the coast. Uh, we don't see that same, 
that's the, any predations on gray whales. Uh, and this is likely that the gray whale calves are just starting to get their first swims. Um, they're, they're learning, they're, they've gotten stronger, they've spent more time with their mother, they've gotten more skills. Uh, but when they're coming up the coast right from Baja from their summer, um, from the summer breeding grounds, they're very much vulnerable. And as they cut across that deep water Monterey Bay Canyon, uh, they don't have the protection of the coast where they can hide in kelp beds or they can hide close to the shore uh, where gray whales typically go. They cut right across this deep canyon to save time and likely energy. And as they go across the canyon, the transients ambush them. Um, so uh, we do see, so these are pendiped stations, different predations that we've witnessed in Monterey Bay. And, and uh, you can see that deep water canyon there. Uh, here with pendiped predation too as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, these guys are big game hunters. We, uh, in comparison to the harbor seals that are being hunted predominantly by the coastal community, uh, gray whale calves are a bit of a specialty for the transients here. Um, and they've likely evolved and adapt, have specific adaptations for hunting these, these large cetaceans. Um, so here's some of the different cetacean species we see. Uh, we've had attacks on a, on a humpback whale, um, common dolphin, dolls porpoise, um, gray whale calves, uh, as well as a minke whale. Um, so when they often get a gray whale mother and a calf, they'll split, try to split them apart. And usually they do this type of foraging we, we've kind of started calling uh, canyon foraging. And usually it's an individual, a, a family group will spread out um, in a line and they will do synchronous dives. And on occasion, uh, the matriarch of the group will disappear from the group and she'll, we will we'll look and look for her and we often can't find her. And uh, suddenly she'll have a gray whale calf on, uh, a gray whale mother and her calf on the run. Um, and the others will turn towards her. Uh, once they get the gray whale though, they'll try to keep pace with the gray whale mother and calf for prolonged periods of time until the gray whale calf starts to tire. At that point, they'll try to separate them. Um, if they can get this calf on their own, um, they will then resort to ramming. As you can see here, this killer whale here, ramming the lower jaw here. Um, often it's directly directed at the head of the gray whale. And the, the head of the gray whale, especially the lower jaw is once a, once a gray whale is killed is kind of an area that is preferred. Um, they'll eat the lower tongue and the jaw. You can see here, this is a group that have just killed a, a gray whale calf um, that we were with and they are, they're eating the lower jaw here. They actually, actually split open the torso completely. Um, on occasion though, we're very lucky. We get to see a gray whale that's washed up on the shore after a predation event. Um, and you can see some of the rake marks that we get here. Uh, so these are bite marks from killer whales. They'll rake their teeth on them. They're quite deep. Um, it's often a way for them to cause injury, but also to startle the animals or frighten the animals. Um, and so once that calf is uh, separated. Uh, humpback whales are also attacked occasionally. We've got a humpback that often have injuries to their flukes. Um, you can see here, this animal here has a bit of an injury to it. Um, they'll have rake marks on the undersides of their fluke. Um, so once a gray whale calf is killed, they'll eat the lower jaw and often leave the rest of it. And it's uh, one of the interesting things that we, we, are, we are trying to understand is that maybe that these predation events may actually provide ecosystem services. Um, the deep Monterey Bay Canyon, especially at the, uh, the submarine canyons are very oligotrophic, which means there's not a lot of nutrients in it. A lot of the organisms down there rely solely on carcasses or detritus that actually comes to the bottom. So a gray whale calf or a large gray whale that is deposited to the bottom, a lot of this work has been done by Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, can provide uh, thousands of kilograms of, of food or biological matter to this community. Um, in particular, you can see in some of these uh, images here, uh, or sorry, this artwork here, you can see Pacific sleeper shark, some of these different animals, um, uh, worms, specific worms that are only associated with the carcasses of, of whales um, have not been identified elsewhere, uh, provide a lot of, these carcasses provide, provide a lot of food for, for the communities, these deep water communities. Um, we see some other species though, like I mentioned, minke whales. Um, California sea lions are also attacked quite often by the outer coast transients. California sea lions are attacked throughout the year, uh, where gray whales are only attacked during um, the during that spring period. Uh, so uh, down here you can see a California sea lion. Here's a small little video of just some behavior. This California sea lion got very close to our research vessel and decided to hang out there for a little while, but they ended up in the end, they ended up getting it.
So we do see a lot of predations on sea lions. Um, and uh, the California sea lions by far the most abundant uh, pinniped on, the, on uh, the California coast. Uh, and this is what's really interesting for us is looking at this, this population of different prey species is likely one of the reasons why a lot of these killer whale communities, these transient communities are really adapted to these specific areas, uh, especially with the coastal transients being much more adapted hunting with these between haul out sites and um, in coastal waters that are very shallow, where the transients off the outer coast are, are less frequently seen in the coastal waters, but are much more adapted hunting large cetaceans in open water. So number of animals um, during predation events stays about the same, but we on occasion do see these larger groups, especially with gray whale hunts. Um, and we see qu quite frequently, uh, well, not frequently, but on occasion groups of uh, 10 to six, 16 on average, uh, for gray whale predation events. Um, and that often involves um, um, much more much more socialization because uh, we get whales up to, I think the largest group size we saw was 34. And um, the tongue and lower jaw, which is often what we, we see most, uh, is often not enough to sustain the whole group. So it, it may be interesting that some of these transient groups may form um, in sort of like a potluck uh, uh, kind of uh, sharing of the prey, but also this that a gray whale hunt may provide that social behavior that's um, so important for the community there that uh, may span the open ocean and offshore waters and not get a chance to actually frequently uh, interact. Um, this is one of the interactions with these outer coastal transients in British Columbia waters. This was just off Victoria. Um, so just coming back, this is just to show you again a little bit of this distribution off the Pacific coast and uh, what kind of our data set shows of the different, the different uh, sightings that we have. Um, outer coastal teas also spend a lot of time, like I mentioned, outer water. This was one of uh, an encounter with a brand new group of killer whales we had never seen before. There were three large males and this encounter was really unique. There was uh, 40 killer whales in this encounter off of Kenny, California. And uh, mixed in were a group of these unidentified transients, um, also a group of group that we knew as outer coastal teas from California, and as well as 15 transients from um, the coastal community um, from British Columbia that were all mixed in and they were about 30 kilometers offshore. Um, so a comparison, um, group sizes, very similar uh, between the outer coast and, and coastal community. Uh, so we do see the similar four to five animals. Uh, so there is that, that dynamic, that's that uh, population or association dynamic of, um, of transient killer whales that's so ingrained. Um, but the diet is very different, as you can see here. Um, harbor seal does not make a significant amount of the outer coast population, but does make a, it does contribute to the coastal community where a gray whale um, is completely the opposite um, for transients uh, in the outer coast and coastal community. Uh, conservation as top of the food chain, these animals are, um, uh, they deal with a numerous pressures um, from uh, increased boat traffic to PCBs, DDTs and pollutants, bioaccumulating pollutants um, are a major issue uh, that we still, we really don't have a grasp on or understand how it affects them physiologically. Um, what we do know is that um, PCBs and DDTs have had, uh, have, um, are immune disruptors. They've had, uh, especially in pinnipeds, um, and it's been known. Um, but we also do know the fact that transients also are dealing with a noisy sea. Um, constantly there's, as, as, as predators that use um, um, passive listening to find prey, uh, it's, we're not, it's poorly understood how noise affects transients, um, but that's an area of study that still needs to be done. Um, as well as interactions with their prey. Um, it's not uncommon to see pinnipeds, harbor seals, or sea lions getting onto the back of, re uh, back of uh, vessels, like this fishing boat here. Um, and this is a problem because often the transients will abandon the hunt. And a hunt can sometimes last between five minutes to over five hours, depending on the species. Um, like I mentioned, that sea lion that we saw that was being attacked uh, was a four hour hunt. If it was to jump on the back of a vessel, then that could be a lot of energy that's been expended in trying to, to get prey. Uh, so we get, so also interactions with vessels can be an issue. Um, also, just to end the foraging here as uh, harbor seals can also jump onto other boats. And uh, this, is, this is a photo here of one jumping on the back of a, a Zodiac from a yacht. 
Uh, for more information, if you're interested uh, in killer whales, um, these are just a couple of there's numerous organizations out there. Um, Happy Whale, NOAA, um, American Cetacean Society, Cascadia, um, the U University of British Columbia's Marine Mammal Research Unit is another good one that's uh, to check out. Um, there's quite a few different organizations that are out there that you can learn more about killer whales. Um, and just remember, even though a lot of the photographs I shared tonight, is this was a very general talk, um, and a lot of the photos with the foraging, just remember that orcas are magnificent animals that must kill in order to live. Um, and I thank everybody here. Thank you for thank you to the Victoria Natural History Society for uh, letting me talk about something that's very passionate. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Josh. That was excellent. A uh, lot of information there. Um, let's see. We've got a few questions on the chat. I'll just uh, start off with those. Um, this one from Michael Jackson. Should we call them orcas or killer whales? Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, and uh, Michael, nice to see you. It's been a while since Antarctica. Um, uh, it's an uh, interesting question. Orca and killer whale are, are um, with orcas, orca is basically their Latin name or sinus orca or orca type of whale. Killer whale being a common name that was given to them based on being whale killers. Um, but they're both, if you, if, or sinus orca um, literally means from the realms of the dead. Um, and killer whale being that they're, they've been seen to kill whales. Um, killer whale, I don't think is a, a very bad term to use. They are, they do kill whales. They are marine mammal hunters. It's a common name given to them. Um, and it's one of the, one of the touchy subjects I know with a lot of people that they don't like the, the word killer whale, but you know, honestly, I think that both names are kind of, they both go hand in hand with the, with the habits that these orcas, that these killer whales have. Okay, and he follows that up with, uh, what are the key things to look for to distinguish the residents and transients? Is there some one thing? That... Yeah, so the, the number one thing I look for, especially if I'm coming on scene with my boat, is the group size. Um, often if I see one orca by itself and there's no other orcas in the area, um, likely it's a transient. We get these males that spend a lot of time on their own, but um, if it's a small group of three or four and they're really close to shore and they're going into these haul out sites looking for seals or going into small inlets and bays, um, and if you're not used to the photo identification methodology of recognizing these animals um, as transient or resident, um, that's kind of that, that's a, one of the big things. Um, and the most important is if you actually come on uh, if you come on scene and you see them attacking a marine mammal, uh, that's uh, likely a transient. Uh, residents and transients, though, differ in um, uh, some of the, uh, the, the morpho morphological characteristics. So if you look at residents, the rounded dorsal fin, as I mentioned, that open saddle patch uh, where the black pigments go into the saddle, that's only found in residents in offshores. And typically, if you're working in the coastal waters of BC or Washington or Southeast Alaska, you're likely going to be seeing one of the two ecotypes of transient resident. Okay, and another question from Melissa Anderson. What is the degree of relatedness within the West Coast subpopulation? Any that's, signs of inbreeding or outbreeding? That's a good question. Um, a lot of, there hasn't been a lot of genetic studies um, looking at that kind of um, information. Um, and it's actually really interesting, especially looking at the outer coast and the coastal community. Um, would be even more interesting to look at that relatedness and if who's been siring offspring if there is more mixing. Um, uh, most of that work has been on, done on the resident workers, looking at who parented the calves, especially with fathers. Um, uh, that was work done by Lance Barrett Leonard, uh, Vancouver Aquarium. Um, but no, there, I'm, I'm not totally sure um, what degree of relatedness. Most of that work is done through the photo identification work, which has been done since the 1970s for the recognition of individuals. Um, and we know which families are, but prior to the 1970s, without the genetics work, it's hard to really tell. Okay, and uh, from Miriam said, you mentioned that marine animals can distinguish between transient and resident vocalizations. Can you specify which marine animals? So there was a study that was done in the early 2000s, and um, it was a study that looked at the acoustic patterns of both resident and transient orcas, where they, they actually play back the sounds of different resident killer whales, especially like the Alaskan residents they used as a, a – and this was for the southern Vancouver Island region, um, and they used Alaskan residents, they used southern residents, um, and they used transients, and the – 
the harbor seals that they used this on were able to recognize between the res the coastal residents of the, one, the southern residents and the tran and the transients, but they were equally afraid of Alaskan residents as they were the transients. So it seems to be a learned behavior that the harbor seals were um, exhibiting. Um, and uh, also we know from some of the work that's been done, if you get a chance to go on the UBC um, Marine Mammal Research Unit website, you can see behavioral uh, footage of uh, Pacific white-sided dolphins uh, swimming with northern residents. Um, there's also footage out there of this happening. So there is some sort of um, ability for these for the other cetaceans like dolls, porpoise, and Pacific white-sided dolphins to be able to tell the difference between um, between transients residents. One thing we noticed too when we we're observing uh, resident orcas is that res at sea lions in particular don't get as spooked um, or as scared um, when they come close to a seal hall, but especially on race rocks where the resident orcas frequently swim close to shore or swim close to the uh, sea lion hollows. The sea lions don't react the same uh, to residents as they do to transients. Right. Oh, she also asked, um, why did the T2 fast for 77 days? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I have to ask the T2s, but um, the T2s is a transient killer whales. Um, and it was not just the T2s. Um, Moby Doll actually um, was a, a southern resident orca that was captured in 1964 and it fasted for some time too as well. Um, and it likely could be from stress. Um, or, uh, killer whales have been known to be under quite a bit of stress when they're captured. Um, it could also be the fact that transients, they were trying to feed them. Uh, most of it was fish, actually. Um, they were trying to feed a group of transients. And it's after 77 days, uh, T1 and T2 did begin eating. Um, first, it was uh, very expensive salmon. And then uh, the captors actually switched to lingcod and then to the cheaper herring. Uh, but once they were freed, though, they went right back to marine mammals. And there's that instinctual uh, behavior that they've really kind of adapted over um, thousands of years of, of uh, hunting marine mammals. Right. Um, we have another question here from uh, Jim, Jim Cosgrove. Uh, the province of BC is considering a cull of sea lions. Would you comment, please? <laughs> um, it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, situation that's developing on the coast, um, especially um, that this is something that's happened before in the 1960s um, and and beyond that too. As well, earlier in that, that uh, calls for sea, for pinnipeds, especially the competition with fisheries. Um, one of the big issues that I find here, and I'll be honest, is that um, we're looking at an, a species, uh, well, we're looking at transient orcas as being a community of killer whales that we're just starting to understand these population dynamics for, uh, that they rely on these pinnipeds as their food source. And it's pretty clear now that the, the transient orcas, especially the coastal community, rely on pinnipeds as a part of their diet and that the community has done very well um, and the growth um, with a with close to 100 calves in the last 10 years being born, uh, that they are able to get enough food from the pinniped population. So a, a call, or uh, especially if you don't know the ecosystem um, or the or what that would do to the entire ecosystem, uh, and what a call would do to the transient population, um, that's a that's something that um, I guess we don't have enough information on. Great, thanks. Um, let's see another one here from Michael Rogers. Is there any evidence of interbreeding between the different ecotypes or between the different transient groups? Um, well, between the different transient groups, um, the AT1 transients, um, as far as they know from um, about two or three decades of research have not interbred with the Gulf of Alaska transients. They're, they're very separate genetically, they're very separate um, uh, as well as acoustically. So there is some sort of barrier there likely. Um, but with the outer coast and coastal transients, this is where that whole breakdown, because we've never seen in the wild a resident uh, interbreeding with a transient or an offshore, but within the transient community, especially the coastal and outer coast, um, which are unevenly distributed, as I mentioned, and don't often frequently come together to socialize as far as we know. Um, and they have a distribution that's quite different. Um, that's where it's very interesting is where does that break down? Where does this distinction of communities really starts to, where does it stop and where, or where does it end and, and how do we name these systems? Uh, but in captivity, 
Um, yes, uh, residents have interbred or, or uh, killer whales from Icelandic population or Norwegian population have interbred with, with each other and produced offspring. And as far as uh, I've chatted with a gentleman who did quite a bit of research um, on, um, on, the, on the captive situation, he actually wrote a very good book called Death at Sea World. He, I asked him about that. I said, you know, you've done a lot of research on the captive killer whale situation. Have they ever interbred and did they produce viable offspring? And he did mention saying that there was one or two individuals that did have viable offspring that interbred between different ecotypes. Uh -huh. um, another question here from Annette. Is she surprised at the high number of seabirds in the diet? How are they targeted and captured? So yeah, seabirds, it's not as common as um, what we see with pinnipeds or cetaceans, but um, in, in off the BC coast or in California, we see seabirds being attacked. Um, often it's small uh, birds like common murs or rhinoceros auklets. Um, often it's, they chase them. Um, they'll actually swim underneath them and grab them at the surface. Um, they'll sneak up on them. Um, they'll, and they often will try to, to maim the animal or they'll try, to, uh, they'll try to use their flukes to smack them. Um, often it's not consumed though. They'll leave it to die there. Um, and it's a behavior that can be used to train calves. Um, birds are quite agile and um, a calf will often try to circle and jump on or try to try to uh, try to practice hunting behaviors and, uh, and so that's kind of how we see with marine birds but there's also a really other interesting interaction with the outer coast transients is that it's not always predation um, uh, we find that there's association between albatross uh, black-footed albatross um, which uh, scavenge off of uh, some of the killer whale hunts that we, we witness. And sometimes when we actually see a big group of albatross um, and we hadn't seen the killer whales, um, killer whales are close by. So that's actually kind of an interesting observation we've made. Great. Uh, and finally, which scientific journal is your upcoming paper being published in? Um, aquatic Mammals. And it will be out next month. It'll be in no uh, mid-November, it'll be out. Okay, great. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, looks like Thomas Reinkin has a question. Uh, very interesting, Josh. Really enjoyed it. Uh, how important uh, is vision in their foraging? Obviously, for these birds, it's probably important, but generally, how important is vision? That's that's a great question. Um, I've heard the I like personally. I haven't seen any major studies on vision, um, but I do know that there has been theories out there that transients do switch to vision when they're directly um, on a prey item. So once they've started hunting it, uh, like they're on it, they've actually started grabbing onto it or attacking it. They it's believed that they switch to vision. Um, uh, and probably a little bit of acoustics there too as well. Um, but before that, it's mostly just that passive listening from a distance. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't know too many studies, but I do know they have very good vision, um, both in and out of the water. Uh, so often, one thing we've noticed is that when they're hunting at haul out sites with harbor seals and pinnipeds, they'll spy hop a lot out of the water to take a look at the, and orientate themselves where the haul out site is. Um, and that's often to see where the seals are. Um, and how high out of the water those seals are. We've, we've seen that behavior quite a bit. Good. I, I was wondering specifically about crepuscular and nocturnal foraging. Do you know, does this happen? That's a, that's, um, they do hunt at night. Um, there has been acoustic recordings of them hunting at night where they've actually picked up um, uh, bones being broken. You can actually hear an animal, the bones being snapped. Uh, but I don't believe I've seen any studies specifically looking at nocturnal work, uh, nocturnal um, use and vision. I, I would suspect that maybe some of the, with the new technology coming out with D tags, um, that that might be something that could be opened. Um, I know they're doing that with um, Southern residents recently. They were looking at a, a nocturnal foraging with, with Southern resident orcas, but I haven't seen anything with transients yet. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the floor? I see there's a... I, I have one here. Um, just oh. wondering, when they're eating the uh, 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 pedipeds, do they eat the bones as well, or do they just eat the flesh and strip the bones? Um, that's a good question. Um, with, with seals and porpoise in particular, I've actually, we've, we've witnessed them strip the flesh off of them. Um, often they'll ram it or they'll, they'll 
um, in especially in the Antarctic with the the type B orcas. Uh, when I was in Antarctica, we witnessed thing, this behavior called butchering, which we've seen it with um, with transients as well. But they'll often smack the seal around continuously, or they'll 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 use their flukes, they'll throw it in the air, and and sometimes, especially we've watched this one sea lion in California. They did this too, and they threw the sea lion and basically they rammed it so often and they hit it with their flukes repeatedly that the blubber came right off of the sea lion. It basically um, they shredded the blubber right off of it and then ate it. With porpoise, um, it's not it's not uncommon for us to pick up the rib cages um, and bones of, of porpoises uh, and they'll eat the tissue around it. So it doesn't seem to be bones are very commonly consumed. But with harbor seals, though, um, there's an occasion you'll see them eat the entire seal. There's been we had a transient wash up in uh, Fort Bragg, California. Uh, in 2015, and we, I was sent the analysis, um, the, the basically the stomach contents information in the, the necropsy report from the Marine Mammal Center. And inside the killer whale, this it was a, a Gulf of Alaska transient, actually, they believe that was off of California, and inside was a fully intact harbor seal. So they definitely sometimes eat the bones. Uh, any other questions? Um, I see there's one here on the, the chat. Have you observed a successful humpback attack by a transient yourself? Uh, so personally, I have, I have not witnessed a successful attack. Most of it is um, usually what we call interactions, um, especially in Monterey. There's humpbacks actually actually humpbacks do most of the attacking um and it's usually the killer whales that um have ended up killing a seal or a sea lion and the trans the humpbacks will end up um, what we call bouncers they've been known to actually come in and try to protect um other marine mammals so often transients are usually out bullied or pushed aside from from humpback whales and humpback whales are also a lot more dangerous in other regions of the world if you go to australia humpbacks have been known to be attacked by killer whales um, groups that specialize in that and there is believed to be a transient population off kodiak alaska that um, specializes in and humpback whales as well there's a paper in aquatic mammals actually that was published uh, a couple of years ago on that right I was wondering if, have you ever heard of the, uh, the killer whales attacking an ocean sunfish? Because they seem like sitting ducks yeah. on the surface. Actually, not in Mon you know, we see ocean sunfish a lot, especially in our offshore, offshore surveys in Monterey. Uh, but uh, the actual fish that uh, actually encounter we heard of was in, in Mexico, in Baja, and it was this year. Um, an ocean sunfish was attacked by a group of killer whales, uh, produced presumably Eastern Tropical Pacific uh, ecotype. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, um, there is there has been like I mentioned that a new paper on that on the pop on that potentially the new eleventh ecotype, but um, they had gotten an ocean sunfish uh, recently. I saw footage for. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, one more question. Oh, okay. Carry on. Okay. Yeah. Is there any chance that some of the humpback and particularly the um, gray whales that are washed up on shore, they're found in dead and have died from some kind of uh, collision, that some of those mostly were saying that the, it's ships that have hit them and struck and wounded the animal. Is there any chance that some of them may have been, have gotten away from attacks by uh, transients and uh, have survived only to die? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, and that, I mean, it's definitely, um, that could happen. Like we found gray well, we found actually a, an adult gray well in Morro Bay, California. Uh, photographs of one that actually had washed up dead, and it was definitely been hunted by a group of transients. But they hadn't. It didn't look like they were actually consumed, even the lower jaw of the tongue. So there definitely is that option that some whales may survive the injuries and may and may die. Um, you know, the the encounter with the sperm whales offshore of uh, California. Uh, in 1997, uh, that Southwest Fisheries had had encountered, um, were believed a few of them were believed to have died. They sustained multiple wounds, and some of them that got away, but were basically massive flesh wounds, um, likely may have bled out and died. Uh, but definitely, there's definitely an option. You need to get photographs, like I showed, of the rake tooth marks. Or um, there was one that washed up in San Francisco this year. A friend of mine is a pathologist at the Marine Mammal Center in San Francisco had sent me and it was missing a pectoral fin like the, the flipper um, it had massive lacerations throughout its body so and um, individuals like that um, you know could die from their wounds for sure 
Here's another question I see on the chat. Uh, do males spar with each other for the right to mate with females? That's, that's a good question. Um, as a matrilineal society, um, it's, you know, females are really the dominant individuals in the group. There isn't a lot of competition. Um, we, you know, I, I, at one point we had flown a drone um, and we had actually witnessed what looked like submissive behavior by males with female killer whales. And one male pursued an adult, uh, an older female for quite a long time uh, trying to mate with her, but he was, you know, she'd chase him away or um, so we, and we often don't see males to male contact that way. Um, but there was that one um, encounter we had off of Kenny, California, which was very interesting. Um, so I showed a brief photograph of those three male orcas that had, we had never identified before. And those three males, it was interesting. They were actually using their dorsal fins to hit each other. And they were swimming really rapidly at each other um, at one point. And they would chase each other around and they'd go back to these female groups because the, the three different types of orca, these communities were actually, these transients were all in these big little subgroups. And these three males that we had no idea who they were would go between these different groups and chase each other. And then they'd come back. and. Um, that's the only behavior I've ever seen of, of maybe a possible competition. And why do you think they only eat the jaw? Um, a couple, there's a, could be a couple of reasons for that. Um, the lower jaw may be the most accessible region of the, of a, of a gray whale calf, um, especially in deep water. Um, a gray whale calf that dies will sink quickly to the bottom over time, um, before, um, purification gases bring it back to the surface but initially that will it will it will um it will sink so getting at those lower jaw get you know, their softer areas um and also when you see them uh, i almost when they see them ramming the head of the of the gray whale calf it's it's almost like they're actually going for that area and that could be to break the lower jaw um, and breaking the lower jaw may make it difficult for the gray whale calf to actually breathe at the surface uh, and um, in that way the killer whales can drown the animal much more quickly um, we've seen them jump on top of the blowhole to try to push the gray whale under but uh, and it could also be the fact that uh, it could be a delicacy and it's not just seen in our region in, Cal in california monterey where we witnessed it this bite, uh, feeding on the lower jaw and tongue has been seen in Australia. It's been seen all over the world where big whales have been predated upon. Very good. Any other questions, please? <laughs> Going once, twice. Okay. So thank you very much, Josh, for a very informative talk. Um, hopefully you're you can have a, a drink of water now. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. For an hour and a half. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Hope you guys have a great evening. Yeah, there's, if you read the chat, there's lots of thank yous and people saying great talk. And I didn't read them all off, but uh, you can have a, have a look at that. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, more thank yous. Good. Well, we had um, at the, the, the top, we had 96 viewers. Whoa. So that, that's uh, a record for so far for Marine Night. So uh, obviously a very uh, important topic and uh, uh, interesting one too. So oh. thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, be in touch. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Josh. And thank you everyone for attending. Hopefully you uh, didn't have too much trouble getting on. Uh, I'll, I'll probably hear about the people that did have trouble tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, obviously a very good turnout. I think people are starting to get used to uh, using Zoom. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a it was a great way to to you know I think everybody had a. Um, it was great. It's such good questions, and uh, I had really had a lot of fun with everybody. So, good. Okay, so I guess I'll, with that, I'll end the meeting and thank you again to to Josh and uh, all our participants. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Josh. Good night. Good night, Annette. <laughs>